Tyre was founded in, around the, the third millennia BC, is that correct? Is <laughs> yes. that right? <laughs> yes, about then. It was an island off the coast of southern Lebanon. Yes. And we have, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure most of your viewers know where Lebanon is, but we have some maps later on we could look at. And yeah, yeah. So we're going to be showing you some maps here in just a few moments. Um, Tyre is originally a Phoenician island and was famous for its trade. And so we, they survived because of that, basically, because they were, they were traders, they were merchants. And so they, they didn't typically, they didn't have an army like many of the cultures during that time frame. But they, um, they survived because of their capitalistic sort of, in a way. I mean, they were sort of the fathers of capitalism. Is that... Kind is that a question? A, yeah, that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a long question. Yeah, that, that's a question. Yeah, the Phoenicians developed yeah. on the Levant, what they call the eastern end of the Mediterranean. Yes. And because it's the corridor between Africa mm -hmm. and uh, the civilizations down there and uh, um, Europe and Asia, mm -hmm. then that becomes a great corridor for people to conquer and tromp through. Right. And so many different kingdoms and dynasties and marauding hordes came yeah. whipping along the east coast of the Mediterranean. So they became mm. a very cosmopolitan group. Mm -hmm. They weren't isolated. Yeah. So you get cultures that are at the tip of Africa or mm -hmm. England and they're kind of isolated. They were on Main Street culture mm -hmm. USA. Mm -hmm. And so because of their cosmopolitan nature, they um, became traders. Mm -hmm. And so people would bring in different commodities as they came through and the Phoenicians developed right. a specialty of um, trading the commodities, and when things got a little hot on shore, they developed seafaring. Right. So the Phoenician yeah. Empire actually went from just the southern coast of Turkey um, all the way down into um, Palestine, right. and um, they had many great city-states, Beirut mm -hmm. and Sidon mm -hmm. and Tyre, right. one point was one of the great ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so they... Um, they basically survived, though, as a result of their negotiating skills and their ability to make deals. And because they didn't, as we, you know, we said earlier, they didn't have their own army or anything. They were necessary. They were, you know, people needed them. They needed the spices. They needed the wood. They needed many of the things that. Uh, right, or we could say they wanted. Mm -hmm. Right, because these mm -hmm. were these were uh, luxury commodities. Right. So if you want spice and you want silks from the east and you want the cedars of Lebanon to build your temples in Egypt, right. then you need to make a deal. Right. And you need to have a merchant that's going to do that. Right. And so they found that um, instead of that they would switch allegiance to whoever mm -hmm. looked like was going to win the current war mm -hmm. um, because they really were into survival and then they were valuable as traders and especially when their seamanship enabled them to go and get copper from England and right. you know trade this then you didn't want the conquering armies didn't want to snuff them out yes. they just wanted to incorporate them into their sphere of influence Mm -hmm. Because of their yeah. technologies. Now, they, they also, um, they're basically, our alphabet derived from, from the Phoenicians. Right. Is that correct? Right. So, and for many reasons, I think you can think of it as lingua franca used to be the word mm -hmm. because French was the common diplomatic language in the world. Right. Well, that's changed and it's kind of lingua American mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. airplanes and ships and captains all have to speak English. If you fall mm -hmm. into a foreign port, you have to speak English. That's right. the yeah. lingua American. Well, in the Phoenician mm -hmm. days, it was lingua Phoenician, mm -hmm. that if you wanted to go to port and sell your things and trade with Italy, that everyone spoke and wrote because you had manifests and you had shipping right. things, they spoke Phoenician. And so there's a um, a picture we have coming up later that shows the Phoenician alphabet and how that derives down to the Roman. Right. Which is what we call our alphabet, the Roman alphabet right. and Roman numerals. So we based, right, we based our alphabet on our, and also our number system on... It derived from. It derived from that. It derived from. It's derived a descendant of. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they contributed a tremendous amount. So they had, they had really had a... a a pretty strong influence on culture today as a result of that, as a result of their practices all the way back and uh, when their alphabet uh, was uh, originally derived, which how far back does that date actually? Well, their heyday was 1200 mm -hmm. BC to about 600 BC, but uh -huh. the alphabet was certainly around before that. Right. And cuneiform is found on their sites too. But um, 
Right. And you said that they, they basically sort of incorporated other cultures. So did they have their own religious um, belief system, per se? Well, they certainly would. Mm -hmm. And there were temples everywhere. Yeah. And deities travel like commodities do. Yes. <laughs> you know, they export. Religion is exported. <clears> and <throat> if it looks like a culture is successful, mm -hmm. then the people around them want to pray to their deity because right. they figure they've got an angle onto a powerful god. Mm -hmm. And so the Phoenicians, um, one of their most famous is Astarte, and they right. had many co temples to Astarte, and it was yes. a female goddess, mm -hmm. and you know, and may have derived from, of course, prehistoric female goddesses, but mm -hmm. certainly Astarte was the prototype for many of the female goddesses that came, Athena and Venus mm -hmm. and Mary, and Isis. you know, she becomes the prototype. Would Isis, Isis have been one? Certainly. Yes. Okay. okay. That they all have a commonality, but, right. but that was one of the um, exports right. of Phoenicia would be Astarte. Exactly. So we need to uh, we need to show some pictures, um, Alan. If you'd be so kind as to uh, yeah, here we go. We have um, some of the pictures that uh, we're talking about here. Um, this is actually. Would you like to go ahead and, and talk about what this actually is? Here? Well, we won't linger on this one because this is introducing a presentation that I've given oh, okay. in several places in California. And mm -hmm. last year, I was fortunate enough to. Um, participate in an excavation of a temple in Tyre, yes. which is why we're working around this topic. Mm -hmm. um, but if we could have the next slide there. Um, mm -hmm. Here is for orientation, that's the eastern end of the Mediterranean on the left. And on the right, you'll see a close-up. Tripoli is the northernmost big town in Lebanon. And mm -hmm. Tyre, you'll see down there in the south. But that distance is the same as from the Golden Gate to Monterey. Interesting. Just That's to give us all a perspective, sometimes mm -hmm. so much is happening in the Middle East, you think it's some huge country. It's mm -hmm. very small. Yeah. It's a very small, there's mountains on the inside. Um, the coast then, you can see why the Phoenicians were mm -hmm. sea-oriented, mm -hmm. because they're sitting on the mm -hmm. coast. So um, let's go on to the next slide. And um, So here's modern Tyre. Now, mm -hmm. um, the little knob on the end of that peninsula is the island of Tyre. Okay. And um, we can talk a little bit um, about how it became a peninsula mm -hmm. um, because islands are very defensible. So mm -hmm. another reason that these <coughs> Tyre survived so many conquering armies marching up and down the coast is because they were on an island right. and they had the ships. So pretty much the army couldn't get out. And this changed when Alexander the Great came through. Right, so and this was in the, around the 10th century somewhere BC? Is that no, okay? Alexander's 333. 333, okay, okay. So Yeah, BC. Um, so right about that time, he did what exactly? Well, let's see if the next slide is. <coughs> Now, the next slide is about trade. So mm -hmm. we could come back to it, or we could talk about trade now, or uh, what do you want to do? Well, I, yeah, let's go ahead and, and talk about that. Just quickly talk about how, you know, he, what he did to actually change well, that. A, so um, let me see. Do one more slide here. Ah, uh, that's the trade. We'll come back to these. Okay. What Alexander did is he marched down the coast, and he looked at this island that was mm -hmm. holding off right. and he was infuriated he'd already conquered most of the known world and yeah. he wasn't used to defeat yeah. so he had his army build a peninsula a causeway out to exactly. this island he built a causeway out to Tyre he marched his army out and he conquered it mm -hmm. now conquering it means they had to bow down and kiss his ring and then he let them continue trading mm -hmm. but what happens for those of you who live on the coast know mm -hmm. that if you built a berm out into the ocean, the sand is going to build up on mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So it started as a causeway developed into that big peninsula we saw on the earlier slide. Right, right. And now the town of Tyre could get bigger. And during the Roman period, mm -hmm. the Hippodrome and all those Roman um, cities grew up on that peninsula. Right, and they actually built two port cities, is that correct? Um, at that point, was that at the point that they did that? No, Phoenicians always have two ports. Oh, okay. Because That's interesting to know. Because okay. they are traders, mm -hmm. and the winds can blow from the south, and the oh, winds can blow from the north, and you need a point. safe harbor. Mm -hmm. So there's always okay. what they call the Sidon port, which is mm -hmm. your north port, mm -hmm. and then the Egyptian port or the south port. Right. Okay. And so you can move your ships around if the winds are blowing. So very the island always had very, very clever. They were very clever. Yeah, sailors. they were clever. It sounds like they're very, very intelligent people. Yeah. Well, so let's uh, go back. If we can get back to um, the slides that we had earlier, uh, a couple slides be 
Before so this the, is the we're talking about. Here we go. Oh, good. Okay. The conquering of Alexander. So this is Alexander's empire, mm -hmm. 333 BC. Right. Okay. And um, just to give you an idea that he was not used to being thrust aside or not mm -hmm. stomping through the city. So mm -hmm. when he came down, and that's the Mediterranean in the middle, and the little um, tire would sit at the middle of that end of the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. um, in the middle of the empire that um, they finally succumbed. Right. With the peninsula, got a lot of land expansion out of it, mm -hmm. and continued to trade. Okay. Alrighty. Well, um, we're going to wrap up this segment, and I think we have a word from our sponsor coming in in a few moments here. <clears throat> so um, we're going to continue on in the next segment and talk a little bit more about the trade, and we're at, we have some beautiful examples here for you, absolutely wonderful examples. Uh, we have a couple of books and some more exciting news about Tyre. So thank you very much. We'll be back in just a minute. You're watching Amador County's local TSPN. Welcome back, folks. Uh, we have Julia Costello with us this evening, and we're going to continue talking about trade in Tyre. So we have some wonderful examples, and Julia is going to discuss what they <laughs> traded. And let's put that map up. There we go. So this is the trading network, and you get the Mediterranean and the whole um, larger picture that items are coming in from the Arabian Peninsula and further east. They're coming up from Africa, and you even have um, items coming from Spain and down from Europe. And I think our next image, if we can go to that, is a close-up so you can look at this. Now this shows coming up out of Africa, we have gold. We have, of course, papyrus in Egypt, and you're a big knowledgeable right. person about Egypt, yeah, and the, yeah. the linen and the faience. Mm -hmm. You can show your exactly. stone next time yeah. we're on. Um, and then, uh, of course, coming up from the Arabian Peninsula, it's not on there, but that's your famous um, frankincense and myrrh, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. resins. And yeah. so on your Christmas Three Wise Men, that's who's coming up and they're bringing the resins up from Saudi Arabia. Exactly. Um, and then we have um, um, out of Africa, yeah. gold and ivory, Spain, copper and tin, they're bringing us far away from there. Mm -hmm. And Lebanon itself you have to say, has the cedars. And the cedars of Lebanon were famous throughout the ancient world. Yes. And Egyptian <clears throat> temples were built with them. The Romans wanted them. Yes. Uh, the wood, like our cedar, mm -hmm. is impervious to bugs. It lasts forever. You can put it under water. Right. It's malleable. It's huge. It's right. what everybody wanted. So what everyone uses in their cedar chests. You know, you have a hope chest. The girls, you know, the young girls exactly. have these hope chests. And they're lined with the cedar specifically for that purpose right. because they repel the moths and the right. bugs and things. So. And if you ha are in very fancy houses that have a linen closet, it's lined mm -hmm. with cedar. And it has that lovely smell. Well, I wouldn't say my house is that fancy, but we have it. <laughs> you do have a cedar closet. We well, we have. We bought the home from someone who was a general contractor. Yes. So he lined all the closets with cedar. For that, to keep the yes. bugs. So anyway, the cedar is very famous, mm -hmm. and that was the big commodity of the Phoenicians. So yes. they shuttled other people's goods around, mm -hmm. but from the homeland came cedar mm -hmm. from the mountains of Lebanon mm -hmm. and the purple dye, yes. and we should talk about. Mm -hmm. So we have heard purple is the royal purple, royal dye, and people go, why is purple royal? Mm -hmm. And it's because it was a color that's very difficult to get out of nature, and the Phoenicians figured out how to do it, and it was a murex shell. And Murex shells are little univalves. Tiny, and here I have a, yeah. a picture. We have a little shell here. A you little, can see it. Little tiny, tiny shell. Little tiny, tiny shell. <coughs> and this, um, you would boil thousands and thousands of them. And the little bodies inside would make this purple dye. Mm -hmm. And I was on an excavation 30 years ago in Lebanon, and it was a... Um, Port City, it was in Sidon, the big port of Seraphand, mm -hmm. and we found these great oyas, these great rims of these huge grims, and about 10 centimeters down from the edge was a purple stain, and we were all just went, oh, we know what this is. This is the yeah. vats where they boil the murex to get the purple dye. Yeah. And it was so expensive then, the kings of Europe reserved it for royalty, mm -hmm. so it was called royal purple. And it was literally, it was literally extremely expensive. And, and from the research that I did a little background, it said, you know, one ounce was typically, uh, you know, I mean, just a, a tremendous amount of gold was traded for one ounce right. of this stuff. 
Okay. So they made a very, they marketed mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. <laughs> this mm -hmm. discovery of theirs, and of course they kept the secret of where it came from. Now the result of that is there are no, there are two species of muric shells, which I cannot just rattle off, but this species, species that made the purple dye is yes. no longer existent. So it is extinct. So it is extinct, so this and this little shell I found on the beach, actually a woman who was on the dig with us, they knew I was looking for one, mm -hmm. and she came back one day from a walk and she said, look what I found for you. Oh, it was yeah. very sweet. So I have a little yeah. muric shell to bring home. So that's fabulous. Yeah. That is fabulous. So one of the other things was the glass. Okay. So Phoenician glass mm -hmm. is another big um, mm -hmm. hallmark, and they learned how to blow and make delicate pitchers and goblets and plates, mm -hmm. and Phoenician glass was exported throughout that big network that we yes. saw on the map there, right. Um, right. and carefully, one would imagine. Carefully, yes. right, and they were, they were also, <clears throat> because of their, um, their shipbuilding capabilities, mm -hmm. they were hired by many, many people as sort of as contractors or whatever you'd like to call them. Um, is, oh. that, is that correct for well, specific they purposes? Well, they were famous builders. They were mm -hmm. practical builders and they mm -hmm. had a great deal of knowledge of how to build cities and how to build mm -hmm. things. And so one of the famous constructions of the Phoenicians is the temple in Jerusalem. Yes. And mm -hmm. so King David uh, wanted to build the finest temple in Jerusalem mm -hmm. and so he would say, as we would hear, who's the best guy to build this temple? Mm -hmm. And he went to Tyre, and King Hiram was the king of Tyre for many decades, a very famous king, and his men came and built the temple in Jerusalem. Yes, yes, and that is not, yeah. you know, not really widely known. No. So this is, you know, this is something that's really interesting and very valuable to, yeah. to know. And the other, the other part of this is because of the fact that they were such successful shipbuilders, mm -hmm that also, you know, they had to be navigators. So would you like to kind of talk a little bit about their success as navigators? Right, that's what I was telling you early mm -hmm. when we were talking before the show. Yeah, exactly. That the, that the Phoenicians, yeah. um, to get to all of these places, <coughs> these far-flung right. places, and there are mm -hmm. some that say they circumnavigated Africa. Mm -hmm. Now there are others who say they don't, but mm -hmm. they certainly got to the Azores. So mm -hmm. they were offshore off the continent mm -hmm. um, and out in the ocean. They certainly went um, around the Indian Ocean, they went around Saudi Arabia, they went through the Red Sea, mm -hmm. and they went consistently. Yeah. And so they knew we don't have instruments left. The astrolabe came much later, mm -hmm. but they certainly knew tides and weather and right. stars and mm -hmm. how to get there and back because they were very successful at it. Right. And then mm -hmm. ship technology, which is the other, mm -hmm. in order to sail, you have to navigate, but you have to have a ship that's seaworthy. Exactly. And so this they brought to perfection, mm -hmm. which is why most of the world let them continue being the traders mm -hmm. for millennia, mm -hmm. because to compete, they would have to come up with a product better than the Phoenician ships and navigation, and they didn't do it. Right. Exactly. It. Exactly. So... Yeah, so they, uh, you know, they they actually contributed a tremendous amount, which, you know, which was also because you know it contributed to their survival as an independent entity in the in the old world, when typically many other cultures were conquered. Is that is that safe to say? Is that uh well, I don't, I don't know that they took it as a survival strategy. Mm -hmm. It happened to be what they did that turned out to be a good thing. Okay. A strategy sounds right. like you plan mm -hmm. it. Right, right. You know, how are we going to get to model <coughs> or something, you know. But mm -hmm. um, they, um, they had a product to sell. They were the ultimate tradesmen and mm -hmm. um, traders. Mm -hmm. And they, had it, they were good at it. Yeah. And evidently they were fair because everyone continued trading with them. Exactly. Others, they took their mm -hmm. profit, but they were the preferred middlemen, you know, mm -hmm. throughout the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Now there's a, um, uh, some liken the Lebanese of today as descendants of that culture. So you talk about culture yes. persevering. So mm -hmm. my saying to that would be that in fact, the Lebanese are consummate businessmen and traders. Mm -hmm. And they have, because of the, problems in the Middle East. They have this, this great diaspora of Lebanon, Lebanese in South America, mm -hmm. Europe, United States, but they are virtually all successful businessmen. This right. is not the Lebanese. They land on their feet and they mm -hmm. figure out how to do business and they mm -hmm. shake hands and they... Mm -hmm. um, 
they all and, and they're you know and they're well they're renowned for that so they they have integrity there's a certain right. level of integrity that they're known for right because you can't be a long-term merchant unless mm -hmm. you're fair exactly. and have a good product right right yeah, this is and they've not. managed to do this for millennia like millennia. you said <laughs> i mean this, that's, yeah. that's saying a lot that's saying yes. a tremendous amount so it's know? a cultural ethic and talent and um yeah. and also be comfortable mm -hmm. with many different cultures and nationalities and religions mm -hmm. that they're very um, tolerant and easygoing and yeah yeah, yeah. so so you all, you've brought some others really wonderful examples here of some things that we want to talk about today so i i really i just am just drawn to this little wonderful wonderful beautiful piece here and i'd like you to tell us a little bit about this well this is the hand of fatma <clears throat> my fatma was muhammad's muhammad's oldest sister mm -hmm. but it's a female deity it is everywhere not only in lebanon middle east pakistan all throughout the muslim world and it's mm -hmm. a sign of um <clears throat> good luck and help um Taxi cabs hang them hanging on their mirrors. Mm -hmm. Shops have them hanging there. It's the universal kind of blessing. Right. And likening back to our talk about Astarte and the Phoenicians, this mm -hmm. is the women deity again. There we go. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And so it's persevered. <clears throat> so this is the way it's come through history to a sort of. It, uh, yeah. It sort of uh, stems from the female deity, the idea of the female deity. Right. So. And the strength. And, the, mm -hmm. and also, I think, usually all the female de deities are quite approachable. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. not um, the Zeus throwing lightning bolts from on high. They're people right. you can ask a favor <clears throat> of. Right, and tell right. your problems to, and ask them to intercede for you. That's that more of a thing. nurturing idea, sort of a, you know, like like women are known for right. basically. Or they might listen. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> actually hear you so anyway this is great fun <coughs> um, and you know it's a good thing to bring back and yeah. I bring it back for friends and this is really special this, this is, is a lovely bowl the um, in the modern world the hammam is the um, mm -hmm. oh, the, um, the back I want to say some beautiful markings in the back as well it's the sauna, it's the steam bath. It's mm -hmm. the steam bath of the Middle East, and these are the bowls used to pour the cold water of yourself and rinse yourself. And, um, mm. So they're very traditional. Yeah, very traditional and lovely. Uh, the designs are just absolutely just lovely. Then they're all the way around, and, and just it's just beautiful, absolutely beautiful piece. So we have a couple of books and uh, we're going to talk about those when we come back and we're actually going to get into the dig which I'm really looking forward to. Great. So this is, I, I originally met you at the library. Yes. And I've been just dying to have viewers see and, and hear about this ever since I met you. I'm so glad you asked. So yeah. um, I'm really excited about looking into, into this next segment. So. We'll be coming back in just a few moments. We have, uh, we have some messages from our sponsors. And uh, we'll see you all in just a few moments. You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN. And now back to Art and Culture with Kathleen Ball on TSPN. A terrible period of war. And so, welcome back, and uh, we have Julia Costello here, and we are going to talk about the dig. So, I'm very, very excited about this. And can we have our first slide, and uh, we're going to go into the dig slides. Um, so, I think we started, so let's hold on this here for a minute. So, um, that I am an archaeologist, and mm -hmm. I began my career in Lebanon, and... Um, many years ago and have kept up my contacts with my colleagues there. So I'm invited mm -hmm. to, this is how I ended up, you know, in Tyre. Right. So here we have the, the Nabi Island on the end that you saw earlier and then the isthmus on the right that connects it to the mainland that Alexander the Great built to conquer the island. But you'll see here the North Sidonian port, the little arrow right. on your left, and the Southern Egyptian harbor. So they can move Correct. the ships around whichever way the wind blows. Mm -hmm. and. The Al Farrar Hotel is where our dig crew stayed. There are 14 mm -hmm. of us 
uh, foreign diggers and about 40 lo local workmen. So we were put up at the hotel and our excavation area is on the other side of the island. Mm -hmm. This whole island is not a mile across. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a tiny little area. So let's see the next slide. So in the 1960s through 1975, and that's when the war in Lebanon started. Between 1975 and 1990, Lebanon is closed. But these beautiful Roman parts of Tyre had been excavated, reconstructed, interpreted, and it was a very wonderful tourist destination. Mm -hmm. So next slide. Then the site is abandoned. The Lebanese war, the Israelis invaded it, 75 to 90. Poor southern Lebanon had a terrible time. The site was never bombed or particularly hurt, but it was overgrown. And you can see these are great bamboo-like reeds that took over the site. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So there had been um, a rumor in the archaeological world that a temple had been found just before the war. And then everyone left the site. The reeds grew up. And my friend Leila Bader, on the left there, um, was pushed out of her site in Syria, where she'd been excavating for 30 years because of the war in Syria. And she said, I'm going to go look for that Phoenician temple that is rumored. Next slide. And here is the ground plan, the great colonnade, that line through the beginning. But um, and the excavated area that the tourists go to and this little blank spot down there was where they thought the temple might be. Next slide. So here is a picture now of that map that you just saw. There's the big colonnade um, slashing down through the right and the big overgrown bushy area is where we're going to dig. To the left of that, all the white that you see is a Muslim cemetery. So we're not going any further in that direction. We're going to have to dig on this spot. Next slide. And if you're wondering how I got lucky enough to go, it's the Old Girls Network. 1972, there's me in the middle with a scarf and Leila, the director, and our friend Martha Joukowsky, who has led excavations at Petra for the last 20 years. And I mm -hmm. participated in digs down there, a couple of them. In Petra? Next slide, mm -hmm. in Petra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's our workmen clearing the site. It was mm -hmm. arduous. It was hot. It was humid, and we had to clear off all this brush to even see what the remains looked like. Next slide. And the walls began to emerge. And now it looks, it looks chaotic, so you have to start figuring out what's going on. Next slide, please. And part of it is just to pick up all the stones that have fallen, because you uncover these stone walls, and if you don't take care of them, they begin to slough in and to fall in. So we had to clean all that up, map the site, identify what was what. Next slide. But emerging in the middle, now this is a plan view and all the little stones have been drawn, and the blue area is the temple. And indeed we found this temple that had been referred to in 1975. Next slide, please. And here is a picture of it. It's a beautiful big rectangle. This is amazing. It's this about is amazing. So exciting. 75 feet long, 30 mm -hmm. feet wide. Um, next slide. And here we're at the other end of it looking out, and that podium at the far end, we're looking at the podium and then the flat stretches out in front. On top of this sits this foreign rock, this rock that you can tell doesn't look as square and as clean as the one it's sitting on, and it has these um, convolutions in it, and it is not from Lebanon. All the other rock is quarried nearby in the mountains, right, right. but the rock on top is clearly something different, imported, mm -hmm. sacred. Sacred. We'll make a leap. We'll something say it's sacred. sacred. Something yeah. sacred. Okay. Next. So what, what would oh, you say yeah. the usage would be for that? What, what would we just don't. It was the first season, and mm -hmm. we'd like to just leap and speculate. But one of the things, mm -hmm. we can go to that next slide. We have okay. a wonderful technician, Sarah, who's doing this, mm -hmm. um, is to look at other temples. Yeah. Right. Look at comparable temples and mm -hmm. say, well, what were they doing? Mm -hmm. And the most famous is probably Amorit in Syria. Mm -hmm. And they have a water feature. Um, this would have been flooded, and in the middle sits this podium right. with a little kind of cubicle on top, right. which something was inside, a statue mm -hmm. or something like that. Next slide, please. So here's our podium, and the other unique things we found is in front of it, there's an oven, and those two angled stones that make kind of a triangle mm -hmm. are the entrance to a chamber um, with a chimney on top that was an oven, and next to it, next slide, please. There was a bone pit, three mm -hmm. feet across, four feet deep, 
packed with millions of little tiny bones of mammals, birds, mm -hmm. fish, small mammals, goat, sheep, and we still have to analyze it, but just looking at it as, as it came out. So would out. that suggest a sacrificial? That's what, yes. Yes. And the other archaeologists who specialize in this part of the world, they're right away they said sacrificial bone mm -hmm, pit. Mm -hmm. And the director tries to be cautious. You don't want to leap to conclusions. Well, of course but not. We all call it the sacrificial bone pit by right. the end of the season because yeah, that seemed right. like what it was. Okay, next slide. And the other thing we found are wells. Now, you have to picture this site um, that soil was built in and accumulated until you're 10 feet deep from the ground level. And if you cut it like a cake, each layer is a different time period building up. Wells are sunk from one level all the way through to the water. So you get wells protruding down um, into the bottom. Here, next slide. Okay. So here we have three wells, and there's our temple in the background. But they date to different time periods. You can see they have different conformation. Next slide, please. And here's the one that's probably associated with our temple, the same square blocks, mm -hmm. the steps going down. So as the water level rose and fell, you would only go down as many steps as you needed to fill your jar. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next slide, please. Of course, it was Phoenician. They had to test all these things, but there's a distinctive wall uh, configuration, and you can see the, um, the headers and then the cross stretchers mm -hmm. um, and this is a standard Phoenician architectural technique so as soon as our knowledgeable excavators saw that they right away said it's a Phoenician construction it's a temple um, I don't know to whom it was a temple but that is something that, um, mm -hmm. maybe we can figure out in the future okay. next slide please and the other telling um, part to make it Phoenician was there's a rear wall behind it which is associated with the temple and now the director thinks that may be the entrance mm -hmm. that we excavated coming from the bottom up coming in from with the, the back podium end. but now mm -hmm. that she's looked at it she thinks the main entrance must have been there next slide please and there's this distinctive there's Layla it's called um, an Egyptian gorge and it's mm -hmm. an architectural te technique you can see the little line and then there's a curving cornice that comes out over it and the same cornice next slide please is at Amarit. It's interesting. So it isn't so, so fascinating to do the comparative studies and see just exactly, you know, that these other features are in other sites, in other locations. Right. And That's fascinating. Well, and one of the reasons you do it is you're going to go to, in front of your professionals and present papers, exactly. and they're going to go, how do you know it's Phoenician? Exactly. And you need to have your data together, you mm -hmm. need to have done your homework, mm -hmm. show the parallels, show that this is typical of that exactly. site. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's one thing about archaeology is that, you know, I've always found with, with you know, I know many uh -huh. archaeologists, and, you know, if it's not in the record and if it's not, you know, you don't have an a, 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 a actual example, they don't speculate. They do not no. speculate because that's not part of archaeology. It's based on archaeological evidence. It's based on fact. So, right. Yeah. But you have to make a story. Yeah. And you can't be so cautious that you never tell the story. So you have a certain amount of facts from an excavation mm -hmm. and you make the best story possible. Yeah. But then if you get more data, then you have to be willing to change your story. And sometimes right. archaeologists get stuck in their story <laughs> yeah. and they don't want to hear about the new well, data. Isn't that, isn't that pretty much, but, you know, everybody in academia, that. yes. you know, that's a difficult position to be in, you know, to, to have, have to, to back, back up. From and, the book that you published yeah. and now it's wrong. Exactly. Nobody likes exactly. it. Exactly. But it's reality. And this is the way that that's science right. is. You know, science okay. develops, you know, I mean, it always has. Right. So. And you have to be flexible. You have to be flexible. And the other danger is you can't go into a dig like this mm -hmm with the answer already in hand. Exactly. Because then you're going to ignore data that doesn't mm -hmm. support it. Exactly. And so we had to, that's why we didn't call it the sacrificial bone pit right away. And yeah. We yeah. called the temple the large structure <laughs> until it was just so clear that it was ridiculous. Yeah. So then yeah. we started calling it the exactly. temple. Well, well let's, uh, let's see. We have more slides. Is yes. Right? Are we, we, do we, are we we're good? We've got a couple more minutes. Okay. And, um, so the other interesting thing is there's mason's marks on mm -hmm. the blocks. And this mm -hmm. is, um, these are Phoenician letters. They mm -hmm. look familiar to us, but mm -hmm. they're Phoenician letters. And they have appeared on other Phoenician sites, but no one's ever actually studied them. They're kind of mesmerized with the grandeur of the whole temple, but we decided, Layla decided, to start collecting them and looking at other sites and perhaps 
in the future, you could identify quarries on the mainland, which would be wonderful to now, do. See, this would be fascinating. This would be great. This would be wonderful yeah. if they could actually put this together. That right. would be really wonderful. And the first step is gather your data. Yeah, gathering yeah. your data. Gather your yeah. data. Next slide, please. I think there's one more of these. Mm -hmm. Here, it looks like an H, but it's on the side. And again, these are Phoenician mm -hmm. um, characters marking. Right. And they also, they could mark a quarry, but they could also mark a job. Mm -hmm. Like you would stamp it and say, all these stones are going down to Hiram, or all these stones yeah. are going to Tyre, and so it could be a job number. Exactly. Like we do. Okay. Yeah, so we have, we have some more slides when we come back, and we also have some wonderful um, history, and we've got a surprise for you that uh, we won't talk about right now, but we're going to get into that. I'm really excited about this. Um, we have a couple more examples of some things we'd like to show you, and we're going to be talking about what's going on today in modern tire. That's so right. good. We'll see you in just a few moments. We'll, we have a break and get some messages from our sponsor. And Julie and I will be back, and we'll tell you a little bit more about Tire. So thank you very much. You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN. And now back to Art and Culture with Kathleen Ball on TSPN. Welcome back, folks, and uh, I'm here with Julia Costello. We're going to talk a little bit more about Tyr. We have, um, we have some examples. We still have a few slides we want to show you. And then we're going to talk about modern tire. And we yeah. also have a wonderful surprise um, and some DNA studies. Yes. So we're going to start with the slides, if we can see our next slide. So this is, I'm not going to become too archaeological on you, but these are the layers um, that are in the soil and when archaeologists dig down they peel them off one at a time and the key to dating these soil levels, next slide please, is the pottery that's in it. And the pottery not only changed over time so you get styles of change, but you get pottery from Cyprus and pottery from Egypt and pottery from the Hiskos coming down from the north and so you can really, they've mm -hmm. developed a very good typology where you can really date these things very tightly. Yeah. So each little layer, see has a bucket and a tag, next slide please, and it's all laid out yeah, yeah. then at night and we study it, next slide, and what the diagnostic pieces have glazes mm -hmm. and you know stamps on them and things like that and then they can be very precisely dated these layers of earth and therefore date the temple now these can also be carbon dated is that correct the pottery not so much not so much not so much okay. and actually the carbon has a plus or minus 50 or 60 years and they have the pottery sequence down so tight it's better than carbon dating okay, I okay. Know. very good but, but if you didn't know yeah. yes and if you got into unknown areas but in this particular phoenician one we're the, the pottery is so well known and so well mm -hmm. dated. Very good. good. That okay, good. That's, that's good to know. Yeah, next slide, please. Now we found this temple. Uh, we're in this little country. Everybody keeps track of archaeology. We made the front page. Mm -hmm. Next slide. We won't belabor it, but the downside of that is that we started having enormous quantities of visitors. And these aren't just strangers coming in. These are colleagues. The American University of Beirut was the sponsor. This is where my friend mm -hmm. Leila is the director of the museum. So all of her colleagues mm -hmm. need to come down and her friends yeah. from Beirut. And the friends of the people in Tyre and the important people in Tyre want to see the dig. And the other archaeologists want to see them. And so in the midst of the heat and the pressure and trying to figure things out, she becomes a tour director all the time. Yes, yes. Anyway. So you're, so you're actually informing at the same time that you're trying, you know, that you're actually conducting a dig. Yes. So you're actually, you know, being an informational source at the same time, which can slow things down a bit. But at the same time, you're getting the word out, which is a good thing. Right. So it's, it's a kind of a, you know, how, you know, darned if you do and darned if you don't sort of thing. You know, you want to get it out there so people understand and people, you know, hear about it. But at the same time, you only have so much time to conduct a dig. Isn't that correct? Right. Yeah. Right. Next okay. slide, please. So here is my work crew, just to personalize it. Mm -hmm. There's Mohammed and Moyan and Ali and Hussein. And that's me, of course, in the hat. Number one best crew. We got the prize. I gave it out. <laughs> right. Then. Next slide. 
Um, and my great innovation, because there's always things, it was hot and it was awful, and that I brought a, a umbrella back from Layla's house in Beirut because I needed the shade standing around here. And next slide, please. Soon, everybody had umbrellas. There were beach umbrellas everywhere, and then they couldn't work unless they could sit under the umbrella. <laughs> I mean, it went from, isn't that silly, to I have to have one. Mm -hmm. It was very mm -hmm. darling. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. We stayed, the crew was put up um, at the Alfanar Hotel. Alfanar is lighthouse, and you'll see there on the right in the upper picture is the ancient lighthouse, dating back to Crusader days and probably back to Phoenician days. Now, isn't that to fascinating? That court. So that particular lighthouse dates back to the Crusader days. That's, yes. that's amazing. The foundation isn't is Crusader. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. 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 Absolutely fascinating. Fabulous food. Lebanese are famous for their cooking, and we were giving, we went swimming in the afternoon, had wonderful spreads out there. Mm -hmm. In the morning, you felt like you were um, in purgatory, and in the afternoon, you're on vacation. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. every day. Next slide, please. Now, this is our... Now, this is our surprise, and I want you to go into a little bit of the background of how this, mm -hmm. why this gentleman is on this slide, and why is he important? There has been a worldwide effort over the last decade particularly to gather DNA samples yes. and to track the movement of human peoples. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Smithsonian is a big sponsor of this, yes. but lots of other academic organizations have tied onto mm -hmm. it. So they have gathered DNA from everywhere, and then they want mm -hmm. to get ancient DNA. Mm -hmm. So they get DNA from mummies and DNA from right. ancient sites in North America mm -hmm. and South America and try to see if modern populations can be tied exactly. to them. Well, we, they got Phoenician DNA um, from a mummy and this man if we can go back to the picture mm -hmm. Michele he's our captain there his DNA came out as a perfect match to the Phoenician DNA of 3,000 years yes. ago and he knows it he said right. I mean so I said oh Michele will you pose for me of course I'll pose for you you know yeah he has yeah. this great stance but if you wanted to know what Phoenicians looked like they pretty much looked like Miguel. Like this gentleman here. Yeah. Right. Now, this was traced through the mitochondrial DNA. Yes. Yes. So this is, a, this is an interesting aspect to tracing through DNA. Yes. That it, mitochondrial DNA is a stronger DNA. You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, it's the only one they're using. Right. Mitochondrial DNA mm -hmm. is what they're using now. Mm -hmm. It's ubiquitous. It's in every cell in your body. Yes. Um, and it'll survive. And so when you need to have a match for ancient remains, mm -hmm. um, then that's, that's the... Now, in 10 years, they may have other ways to do it. Exactly. But right now, that's when you trace humans around the world, you're using mitochondrial right. DNA. But isn't that wonderful that you're able to meet this gentleman? And, yes. And that here, you know, this whole thing unfolded while you were there. I and mean, if I you go on their website, you know, and look this up, his picture's there. It's a yeah. portrait of Miguel. It's the yeah. Phoenician match, and he was yeah. right there. That's I thought fabulous. it was great fun. Fabulous. Let's fabulous. see what the next slide is. We're going to run out of time for all mm -hmm. our topics. We stayed in a wonderful facility. There's lab. There's work at night. These team projects are great. Many of you may have gone and worked on expeditions. And it's just you're with smart people, and you're all working on a problem. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And then we're going to talk about modern Tyre yeah, a little yeah. bit. We are and so the modern, modern city, of course, it's expanded. There's the isthmus. Um, mm -hmm. Next slide, please. It's the bustling port. There's the North Port, Sidonian Port, and they go out every day and go fishing. Mm -hmm. The Eastern Mediterranean is not what it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not to pretend there's the same abundance of fish. Okay. Um, but mm -hmm. the men hang out in the port and play checkers and right. um, have the life there. And the fish, you buy fresh fish. And mm -hmm. when we got fish for lunch, it was fabulous. Next slide. Um, and the ancient city has um, old streets, Tyre has built up, and mm -hmm. we saw the excavated area, but there's parts of Tyre that aren't excavated, and underneath all these buildings will be layers um, of pre-civilizations. The arch you see on the left with the little child walking through it, at one point was a tall arch over a street, but now the street has built up, the houses next to it have built up, mm -hmm. and pretty soon even children won't be able to go through there. Wow. Next slide, please. And they're renovating. They have a big um, UNESCO grant to get drainage in the streets filled up, and houses are being painted and repointed. And here's some wonderful cons down by the port that have been redone into a little shop, a coffee shop and a right. lunch shop. And, you know, the architecture is lovely. And it is. It's absolutely exquisite. It's very, yeah. very nice. I noticed that when I was in the Middle East myself. It yeah. was uh, throughout the Middle East, uh, very innovative architectural design that is just lovely. Next slide, please. Um, here's the market. 
There's mm -hmm. typical souks um, in any, typical of any souk in anywhere in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And there's people having coffee. And there's a mix. Uh, Lebanon is very cosmopolitan, so it doesn't the um, clothing where there's one woman fully um, shattered, as you can see on the right. There's a young woman in short sitting at a table with her friend. So there's a great mix and tolerance for lots mm -hmm. of different diversity. Next slide, please. In the spice. Dresses, mm. spices, mm -hmm. women shopping. Next slide. It's a vibrant I modern city. I just love this slide. You do? <laughs> I really love this I slide. know. This is great. I love taking it. Of course, mm. the woman on the left is not the mannequin. She's setting yeah. up the shop for the day, but just to show some clothing. I mean, this is yeah. what's for sale. This is typical modern attire. Is that correct? Yes. Well, I, in the yeah. shop before, we had the traditional dresses hanging. So everything is there. Yeah. So yeah. it's a mix. Right. Yeah, it's a mix. Next slide, please. And here's uh, the women of Tyre on the left, mm -hmm. um, the two um, older women. Uh, there's a Christian woman with the scoop neck, and but her Muslim friend, um, and the edicts say you had to be covered from your wrist to your toes. She managed manages to do that in quite a fashionable style. She does. She's she does. She's attractive in the way she So we her. can't stereotype mm -hmm. exactly how mm -hmm. these women go. She carries it off. The mm -hmm. two little girls, the sisters on the right, mm -hmm. um, in, 19, in 2006, the war in southern, the bombing stopped from Israel in southern Lebanon. Mm -hmm. So these two little girls have grown up never knowing war ah, at their mm -hmm. age. And mm -hmm. my hope is mm -hmm. they can continue. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be wonderful? That would be really lovely. Yeah, that they have not known that in their if lifetime. If that could happen. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Here's some of our young men about town. I don't know if you can read this. And if you notice, if you notice, we have um, the young gentleman on our right <laughs> has a very yeah. uni universal clothing style. <laughs> Yes, that, we, that we see yes. here in the States as well. Right. But the brand so, name Jordash is shown off So there. they're very up to date. These kids are Facebooking, they're, you know, they're on their, their cell phones and they're doing everything that the, you know, our American children are doing today. They're regular folk. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Beautiful. Beautiful. And the Corniche at Tyre, so this is the westward facing. It's a public road. Mm -hmm. It's public beach. At nighttime, mm -hmm. people pour out and play ball and smoke their mm -hmm. pipes and um, have picnics out there and it's public access and they still love the sea. They're right. still oriented right. to the sea. Okay. And lastly, just real quick, you know, I'd like to go and mention you weren't in Lebanon by accident. Your ah. grandfather. Right which is what this book is about. Um, Arabian Night is the title of this book. And this is your grandfather. Is this is correct? my grandfather, by mm -hmm. Thomas Lippmann, who's a wonderful historian. And grandfather was born in Sidon, just north of Tyre, yeah. Um, yeah. to missionary nice. parents who ran schools there. And they, his father was born in Lebanon. Right. So we go back mm -hmm. to the 1850s, the family does. Right. Um, and he um, went into the um, diplomatic corps. He was a... PhD in Swift and went in, in the OS, ran the OSS in World War II and was the mm. first ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So, so he's what they call an Arabist. Right. So it was in, in you know, it was a family uh, It's a family, family affair. Interest. Yes. And I was exactly. coming in to be the archaeologist. Yeah. And so that's wonderful. And yes. it's absolutely fabulous to have you on the show. Oh, and it's just so been wonderful. Thank you and so we, much. We're looking forward to maybe having you back and talking about Petro possibly at a later date. But thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you all later, folks. And I hope you enjoyed the show. We will uh, we'll see you next month with a new show, and we are going to have a, another gal coming in next uh, next month, which will be a surprise. So um, we thank Julia Goodbye. for coming in, and uh, we'll see you later. Thank have you. Have a so good much. evening. Yeah. You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN.